Thank you very much, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully the party wasn't too late, I mean, too late last night, and you're all awake with, 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 with caffeine in your system. I want to say hi to everyone online as well. Um, what we'll do today is I'm going to, I'm Kirti Melkote. I'm the uh, founder of Aruba Networks, and uh, my latest title is Chief Strategy Officer. I've been called worse before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I, can, I have a presentation that will go into uh, architecture. Um, specifically, how would you build networks out, starting with wireless first, rather than wireless as a overlay to wired, which is kind of the, the way the world has been over the last, I would say, 10 years or so. But uh, the industry has moved in a direction where we feel pretty comfortable that, that enterprises can uh, redesign with wireless as a primary network connection and wired as a secondary. But I, I think the we have not frankly, uh, talked about what would, 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 a, would a network architecture look like that led with wireless. So I'll, I'll try to go into that. Um, all questions are game. I can go as deep as you want on technology. So I have a whiteboard. If I need to go off script, we can do that too. Uh, after me, I think uh, we'll have some demos around the BYOD theme, which is clearly a very big uh, theme these days. And then uh, we'll get into a product uh, demo with Aruba Instant which is our newest uh, virtual controller based uh, you know solution um, and we have team members behind the scenes as well who can who can help answer the questions all right so without further ado let me let me jump into the presentation uh, let me first i guess start out with if you were to um, think about networks over the last even 20 years 15 20 years what we built out was was, was fundamentally uh, a notion of uh, a network with managed endpoints. People uh, first built out networks for data, managed computers, PCs, laptops, and so on, connecting over wired ports. And then when voice over IP came along, VoIP ports, right? And um, over the last 10 years, while Wi-Fi has grown up, the, the uh, way the network was built hasn't really changed, in the sense that the managed endpoint model was still predominantly the case, because it was still a laptop, corporate issued laptop with you know blessed images and antivirus software and firewall and all these things that go on the laptop so so device oriented um, you know essentially endpoint support etc was the realm of basically the help desk group or or the endpoint uh, you know management group but what's happening today with the advent, especially I mean, we started to actually notice this after the advent of the iPad, I think all of you, you know, they're entering the network, fueling this trend of BYOD, bring your own device. And um, as we talk to customers, um, the biggest concern today is clearly security. You know, I have these devices coming in, my network, I'm not used to allowing foreign devices on my network. What's the model yet? I can't stop them. So how do I secure them? How do I bring them onto the network? Uh, followed very quickly by, okay, assuming there's a security model to bring these devices onto the network, how do I actually deliver corporate services, application services to these devices? What's the right model to do it? Should I do it with virtual desktop kind of architectures? Are there other types of architectures to bring applications over to those devices? And, and the, the, you know, the uh, more important thing we notice is multimedia traffic, you know, consumption on these devices is far greater. So uh, providing a quality of service model for delivering multimedia traffic to these devices is a big deal. And finally, um, how do you bring these devices on in the first place? Do you establish a BYOD help desk, have a budget for BYOD, and then as people bring them in, bring these devices in, you hand them over to the IT folks, say provision this device and bring them on. That's certainly how we do corporate devices, but there's no budget for that. And so creating a different model where the network actually is a part of provisioning and self, you know, bringing the device onto the network in an automated fashion is the, is the third piece. And uh, taken together, networks never did that before, right? Because we just provided ports and said you can plug it in or provided some access points and said, here you go, this is the SSID, here's a security model and you move on. Um, so that, that model, if, if done correctly, if done securely, if the application delivery model is correct, and um, if the provisioning architecture is correct, in that you don't need to create basically another help desk, 
we think you can actually uh, economically uh, shift a lot of dollars f from what is primarily today non-strategic procurement, buying laptops, buying phones, and things like that for users uh, is not strategic anymore. People buy these devices themselves. So you can take those dollars and shift it to something more strategic. And so the economic value proposition of enabling a, a secure BYOD model is actually huge. And which is why I think over the next 10 years, as we look at networks, uh, embracing BYOD correctly is going to be uh, you know, where, where enterprises will start to make a huge difference for themselves. Correctly being, you know, the, the one thing I do want to say, you know, BYOD is all the rage, but there's real security concerns around BYOD. And uh, my only, only um, uh, request there, I guess, would be to look at the risk profile of what you're exposing on these BYOD laptops and how correctly to do it. Because every enterprise has risk, and it's about risk management. Um, maybe some data is not viable to be shown on a BYOD device and only allowed on a corporate laptop. So evaluating risk and figuring out what the BYOD strategy is going to be a pretty big aspect of this. The, so so we, we go out there, advise enterprises fundamentally saying, if you were to build networks from the ground up again, with wireless as a primary uh, model, then think of BYOD and take advantage of BYOD because it's going to be good for not only your users, but good for your bottom line as well. The second thing that we talk about, of course, is BYOD is all about wireless. It's very rare to bring a BYOD device and I want to plug it into the wired network. It could happen, but increasingly less so. Um, if you look at laptops, they still have some wired ports, but if you've been to the CES show lately, uh, the newer devices, laptops, don't have even wired ports. They're all coming with Wi-Fi only. Uh, wired is really hard to get. You need to go buy a dongle, get an Ethernet port, and plug into the USB or whatever. So, so uh, which basically means the, the uh, wireless network model has to shift from this, if you're an enterprise, um, shift from providing conference room access and whatever bleed I, you know, I get from the conference room is the coverage I have, to providing a capacity-oriented model for Wi-Fi, where I have a lot of devices coming in. So instead of designing for coverage, you're designing for capacity. And that, that again, is a big shift, because I, I remember talking to customers, and um, most of them saying, I have you know, 100 users, 1,000 users on my network. These days, when I talk to customers, they talk about I have 5,000 devices, 10,000 devices, because every user walks in with three, four devices on the network. So, um, and, and yet, the, the phenomenon is I don't have good wireless coverage. I don't have my five bars. And so if, if you look at what is happening there, a lot of budgets on the access networking side are trapped on the wired side. You're paying maintenance. You're, paying, um, uh, you're buying more gear. Uh, on, the, on the wiring closet, and that is not getting used. And about three or four years ago, one of our customers, California State University, um, they are a, they're one of the largest you know, university systems in the country, about 500,000 students in about 25 campuses. They had budget for every campus to do wireless, and um, what they realized was they could only, with the budget that they had, they could only cover the common areas. They really couldn't provide you know, coverage everywhere. And um, yet, if you look at the utilization of the network, it was all, all the demand was coming on the wireless side. And um, so, so they looked at their wired network and the wireless network and said, let me take the budget that I had on the wireless net uh, wired network, shift it to wireless, and right size the architecture. So instead of having eight switches in a wiring closet, they have two switches in a wiring closet, a lot more access points. And that model, again, is an economic model, right? You go out there, you say, my, sh my demand is shifting to wireless. So um, you know, we got into wired switching uh, earlier uh, last year. The reason for that is primarily to enable a wireless primary network. Because uh, none of the wired-oriented uh, folks out there are going to lead with that message. They, they are going out there selling more ports and treating wireless as a secondary network connection. And, and we wanted, and we couldn't frankly partner with a wired guy because the access points still plug into the wired ports. And the customers came back and said, 
why don't you partner with the white guys? Nobody wants to partner with the white guy, with, with the wireless guy, because they're going to cannibalize the white poles. And so we have to go out there and, and build a switch where our access points could plug into that allowed us to offer essentially a full solution saying you don't really need to go anywhere else for the access architecture. And, and finally, the, the last piece that we talk about is network services, network management, uh, security services, et cetera. They're very siloed because networks were built in a very siloed way. We started with wired, we added remote access, then we add, added wireless, and every uh, access method created its own set of management tools and security tools, leading to siloed management models. So, so unifying them, again, there's an economic, economic imperative to doing it. And together, we think, if you take this together, lead with BYOD, right-size the access network, unify the network services, will not only lead to a model where users are happier, but actually you can save a bunch of money going in this particular direction. So that's the high level what we talk to customers about, the top three things, if you will. Um, and um, the next steps uh, from a Wi-Fi perspective itself, if you look at where Wi-Fi has been, and here we can start to you know, dive into the technology and please feel free to ask questions. The first generation Wi-Fi that really was mainstream was dot eleven ABG. Right, um, and, and primarily, as we all know, meant for occasional access. Uh, that's what it was used for. There were exceptions, obviously, in higher ed and so on, where, where pervasive wireless networks were built. The focus for the industry was how do you make the setup very easy? How do you um, automate the RF management process, not have to set up channels and power levels on access points, and create a... Um, did I, Step and, and create a, a very simple way to build out wireless networks. After this, we, we introduced 11N, and 11, we are in the era of 11N. Uh, devices have changed from being nomadic, where you, it's laptop, to basically being always on. Um, so, and the RF architecture really shifted the emphasis, shifted from easy setups are taken for granted. What you need to now focus on is optimization because the spectrum is scarce, a lot of devices coming into the network. How do I provide a, a, a model where I can optimize the, the over-the-air experience? And uh, features like band steering, which are all become commonplace now, load balancing and things like that are what um, the industry focused on. As you look to evolve you know, Wi-Fi further, and today we can do up to three stream 11N, 450 megabits per second, with 11AC, as you know, at least the first generation of 11AC products that will come out, uh, my guess is sometime early next year, we'll, we'll have uh, basically uh, the ability to go to up, up to gigabit data rates. And maybe TCP throughputs around 800 meg uh, per client, right, which is pretty significant. Um, the, but, but, but the mix of devices are still going to be, there'll be a transition that'll happen. There'll be mobile devices that'll still have single stream 11N, and there'll be laptops, high-end laptops that'll be capable of operating at very high speeds. Uh, the, the, the emphasis, we think, is going to shift from being simply optimization to optimizing the application layer so that we, we understand the app that is being consumed and we optimize the air for delivery of the app. So if you're looking at a video stream, for example, which is, if you read all over the internet, video traffic is what is creating a, a great deal of demand, fundamentally because there's a great amount of traffic over a sustained period of time. How do you deliver that and still make capacity available for all the different applications? The other interesting development that um, I'm beginning to see is the notion of a personal LAN within the context of an enterprise. Um, so until now, we, we are, we are um, and the example that I wanna, I wanna use is, it, it's evolving in the university sector, is I have, um, let's say my, my uh, Apple TV service or my laptop in my, uh, or, or my, um, my, my home printer in my dorm room, and I wake up in the morning, I walk to classrooms, and I wanna access my personal LAN when I am sitting somewhere else across the campus. Is there a model? And, and most of these services are discovered using protocols like MDNS. And as you know, um, MDNS is a local broadcast technology. It will work only in the notion, in the context of that geographic domain or within the you know, construct of a VLAN. 
So as you roam now across campus, you're not going to be on your personal LAN anymore. And if you want to still have access to all your personal LAN services wherever you go, how do you create this overlay on top that allows you to carry your personal LAN concept with you? That's a, a very new concept that uh, we're beginning to see emerge in the higher ed sector. Uh, I think there's use cases that will come into the enterprise as well uh, with that particular concept in mind. So, so those two areas, video and you know, multimedia optimization and personal lands are probably the area that uh, we'll see as, as the killer apps driving .11 AC. Do you see um, editorial 11 AD as actually being used uh, in the enterprise as opposed to being just purely a home? Uh, I do. I do. Uh, but not in the first uh, phase of it. I think the first phase of it will be basically uh, HDMI replacement in the home. Um, <coughs> But uh, over time, as the technology commoditizes and, and you know, we are able to bring it into the devices themselves, uh, more computing devices, uh, I, I see a potential where you can use AD to a projector uh, you know, and project. Instead of having all these cables plug in, uh, there's no reason why you need to kind of do that. right? So you're in, inside a room, you want to project, use dot lemon AD. So in those kind of use cases, I see some, some potential. Uh, but this industry has surprised us every time. So uh, we, we'll see where it goes. I'm pretty optimistic, uh, mostly because um, I'm actually optimistic of it, the extra spectrum that I get in 60 gigahertz. Yeah. And we'll figure out some use for it, I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, make sense so far? Any questions on AC or AD? OK. So uh, now I'll, I'll get into the, the uh, architecture bit a little bit. Um, how, how do you build out a network wireless first? If you look at most networks today that are built around the notion of a wired first architecture, what I try to do here is draw a picture of what happens when a user sends packets into the network, right? Basically, what you get is users, devices plugging into this wall jack, and behind we have our beloved access distribution core uh, switches, and then you have a firewall and a server behind it. The point here is there's context that gets established around the user. Who is the user? What device are they using? Where are they connecting at? Which we call user context. And what applications and content they're consuming on the network, which is the usage context. The way to tie those two together in networks today is VLANs. And the first set of VLANs we, we laid down were data VLANs. This is when the network first got built. And then when Chambers came out and said voice will be free. Nobody believed him, but you know, voice over IP did happen. And, and uh, what, what basically the, the model for voice over IP was, I need to provide some QoS on my network. That's the context for VoIP. I have a device that plugs into the port. And the way I articulate context into the network is to lay out voice VLANs. I go out there, uh, I tag the bits as they come into the network or they go to the voice device. Um, and, there, and then I translate the tags. If it's dot, if, it, if it's layer two tags, that's dot one p. If it's layer three tags, it's diff serve code points, and life is good. That's the wide network. You take this and cookie cutter that across all the floors of an enterprise, and you get your wide network. Now you take this and you go. I want to start to add wireless. The first thing that people do: plug in access points. I need a wireless VLAN because I don't trust wireless as, as much as I trust my wired network. So I'll add a separate set of VLANs to wireless. And guest traffic is coming on an open SSID, so I'm going to shift it to yet another VLAN, so at least two additional VLANs. And then you go, I have BYOD coming in. BYOD is not corporate wireless. I need a different policy for BYOD. So the context for BYOD uh, is another policy, and that's yet another VLAN on the network. But to get this BYOD device onto the network in the first place, I have to provision the thing, which leads to another VLAN. And then you, you bring uh, your, your BYOD device and you want to consume video on it. Now imagine if you're using the voice model of the network, the wired network. If video were to go on its own VLAN, what the user experience would look like? You basically turn off your Wi-Fi, or at least go to your Wi-Fi chooser Pick the video SSID, because that's the only way to transport QoS across the network. Clearly not something people would do. 
or want to do, right? You, you want to use one network, you plug in, you get onto your SSID, you want to prioritize video traffic as it goes through it or voice traffic, and you want the data traffic to go on its own priority. The other thing, of course, I think we all know, mobility doesn't like VLANs. As you hop across subnets, um, you can't renew IP addresses all the time, especially with always on devices. So, so fundamentally, this notion of VLANs that served us really well over the last uh, 15, 20 years, uh, primarily because the context that we used VLANs in was very simple, is not going to scale. And it's really not suitable for mobility. So uh, we asked ourselves, how do we change this? What's, what should it be if it's not VLANs? And um, the, the answer that we came up with was, let's take a step back. What we're trying to do um, is capture context around all these use cases, guests, BYOD devices, provisioning. I might want to pro you know, prioritize video traffic. How, how about I capture all this context live when the connection actually happens, express some policy around the context, and translate the context into the network? If I did that directly without worrying about VLANs, uh, what would the network architecture look like? The, the pieces that have to come together to enable this, first and foremost is some place where you can go and define these policies and control them. If you ask uh, most uh, networks today, if you, if you look at network architectures, <coughs> policy resides around the user in Active Directory. Guests, there is no policy for guests. So you need to go create a new service for guests. BYOD, same thing. BYOD doesn't live in Active Directory. It's not part of the Windows domain. So you need to define your devices in some, some location. Then, and, and, and then the policies associated with those devices. Um, and then you have executive class traffic that you want to prioritize. These things are all policy use cases that are emerging in a pretty dramatic way that didn't have to exist in the wired context. So uh, that's leading to basically a, a, um, a place where you, you, you can go and define the policies. And it's an evolution of the RADIUS server. Um, the RADIUS used to be simply an authentication box that front-ended Active Directory. All you needed to do was validate whether the user was good or bad, and the device was part of the domain. That has to really evolve to be able to define policies in a much more easy to consume manner, rather than define them as ACL tags on VLANs, which is kind of the state of the art today. Uh, and then there's policy enforcement that needs to happen, uh, which is where the, the context that you set gets translated. I'll talk more about policy enforcement in a second. And then, of course, the visibility and management piece to tie the whole thing together. And that is what we think needs to come together in one architecture to enable a true wireless end-to-end -end network. Um, now, taking this one step further, you look at context, how it's derived. The first set of context information around a user and a device is derived at connect time. When you plug onto your network, you authenticate. Uh, you figure out what device you're coming in from, you figure out your location that you're connecting from, and those, those are three inputs into the policy decision that you, you get right at that particular point in time. It's not dependent on which VLAN you're plugging into anymore. Right? So, so first set of context happens at connection time. The next set of context comes around the application usage. Are you using Citrix? Are you using Link? Are you using um, uh, you know, a Skype? Etc. And what this requires the network to do now is to actually look at the applications and classify the type of application. So layer four through seven intelligence, which if you think about switches, they don't do layer four through seven. They're all primarily layer two, layer three. So you need to start to look into the packet packets themselves and even classify them even when they're encrypted, which, which is the hard part actually, because you can't always rely on deep packet inspection techniques to, to figure out which app it is. So when you touch on, <coughs> on uh, classifying applications even encrypted, how do you deal with um, things like VPN tunnels and applications writing within those tunnels that are intended to be um, invisible to the supporting infrastructure? Yeah, so, so I, think, I think if we take a step back and look at what are we trying to do when we're trying to classify applications, uh, there's two things. One is you take a security action, which is I want to deny permit uh, the app to go through, or it's a prioritization type of thing. You want to enable QoS for that particular application. Um, for the security piece, it is fairly straightforward. You, 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 uh, 
because it's encrypted and you don't have visibility into the payload, you either allow the port or you disallow the port. And you, the, the security actually shifts to the place where the encryption gets terminated in the first place. Um, so if it's, let's say, it's a, uh, um, a VPN tunnel, then it's the, the policy needs to exist at the VPN concentrator because that's where you're opening the packets up. Um, if you're doing um, SRTP and SIP, then that's where the, the, um, the policy exists. The, <coughs> the QoS piece is, a fr is frankly the more interesting piece to us because there, even when packets are encrypted, you can actually look at the uh, information surrounding the packet stream. What is the periodicity of the packet? What is the packet size? Um, where are they, what's the source destination types? And there's information, meta information around the stream itself that you can classify and figure out this packet is most likely a part of this. And you create signatures that are not based on deep packet inspection. Frankly, it's looking at, at broader, how is the flow going? And, figure, and that's where we need to go because I personally believe more and more apps will be encrypted and you can't always rely on deep packet inspection to give you information. Where, where it's possible, go for it and figure out how to get app information, but where it's not, you have to look at the other, other parts of it. Um, you know, and, and our customers say it's not just always media traffic that I want to prioritize. I want to, sometimes if I'm a hospital, I want to prioritize my patient monitoring devices even above the voice piece, uh, which is what you would expect a hospital to go do, right? So it's, it's a different class of apps. It's not something you might always find on your uh, device uh, that you consume uh, as you look at the deployments. Um, in terms of the policy actions, so, so the first two steps really give you information about the context. It tells you who is connecting, what device are they coming in from, where they're connecting from, what time of day they're coming in at, et cetera. The second step tells you what apps they're consuming. The next two steps are the actions that you take in the, in the, in the network. One set of actions are what I call security actions. Starts with very simple permit deny actions, but gets increasingly sophisticated based on the type of users that's connecting. If, if it's a guest user connecting, you're most likely going to NAT them out to the internet. So there's a NAT, NAT function that gets performed. If you're using a BYOD that's not yet provisioned, you're probably going to redirect them to a portal page. So there's a bunch of actions like this that you get built up. And there's some very interesting wireless specific actions. These are what I call wired actions. So if you pick a firewall, you probably get these actions anyway. But the wireless specific actions are if you're doing a bit torrent stream and you want to disable torrents on your network because it's, they're sucking up too much bandwidth. You can, you can, of course, stop the stream, but you can also take actions like disconnect the user or blacklist the user if they're doing it again and again and violating the thing. Don't let them even connect to the network. Instead of having them on and then dropping the packet later, just disable the connection right there. Not possible on wired networks. Somebody's saying no. No, Andrew decided to poke the bear this morning because under <laughs> Control access, you have a three letter word that doesn't have anything to do with security. <laughs> Which one? NAT. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it is, uh, I agree with you, it's not security, but it's an action that, that is needed to uh, enable guest access, for example. It's, it's just a standard firewall action, which is why yeah. I put it out there. You, you pull down the actions. No, no, uh, sorry, I, I, you can't tell, but I have the I hate NAT shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> you like IPv6? Yeah, actually, I do. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, I, I, no, I don't like that. I like IPv6. When people tell me they want a NAT IPv6, that's when I get static. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so we, we, we'll put you in the V6 action list good. where NAT isn't, doesn't exist. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, by the way, the, our firewall is capable. The, the controller uh, and the access points handle V6 traffic on the, in the firewall. I don't need to ask the question now. There yeah, there see? We are, we are ahead of the game a little bit there. Exactly. Um, in, in fact, just person to actually ask, answer the question before he asked it. Right yeah. Now. Good. <laughs> and have the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are we're beginning to see a lot more interest in V6. Uh, it's coming from. It started, frankly, in uh, in Asia. Yes. Um, and uh, but but now higher education in a big way. Uh, we are we have a lot of campuses out there. Yeah. And um, if you don't support V6, basically, we, we can't be on the network. And not only do we need to pass client traffic through, our APs need to have V6 addresses. 
uh, our controllers need to have V6 addresses and they need to have V6 tunnels between them, uh, all of which uh, we can do today. Uh, the, the more interesting actions, I think, are, so security actions, I think the industry knows quite well um, and, and well understood. A, a, the very common question that comes up uh, is, why do you guys have a firewall inside your controller or your access point? Why, do, why shouldn't I go buy a third party firewall or use, use my firewall that's already there? I think, <clears throat> I think firewall is an unfortunate um, term that we coined 10 years ago because security was a big issue in wireless and you know people wanted the firewall built in. The, the more important reason, frankly, is imagine a world where all your traffic is wireless. When you're printing, you're going to a wireless printer. When you're communicating link or video, it's going between two wireless devices. It's not very hard to think of it. The firewall sits behind the wireless, and so it's too late. Uh, it'll never see traffic that goes from wireless to wireless, and more and more traffic will be wireless to wireless traffic. And, and in that kind of world, all you can do is do policy enforcement for actions for traffic that is bound to the data center. None of the peer-to-peer -peer stuff actually can be enforced with firewalls. So that, that, for, that, that's one of the reasons why we need that functionality inside the network rather than outside the network. But in the same vein, when you've got two wired users that are plugged into the same switch, you don't traditionally speaking firewall those two users from each other. You don't because the use case never existed. It was a corporate issued device and a corporate issued device needed to talk to each other. Uh, my trust model hey, is, can you, can you uh, the question was, but on the wired network when two data devices talk to each other, you don't need a firewall between those two. Uh, absolutely because the assumption going back to the first point that we made, the devices are assumed to be trusted. Even, and in a guest, even in a guest LAN situation, though, where you drop off a switch into a conference room, abstracting out the conversation about wireless, right? If you've got, if you just provide wire Ethernet ports, you don't, you don't firewall your guest wired users from each other. Yeah, because it's not a corporate security problem. It's a guest security problem, and what the assumption is that the guests take care of personal firewall, antivirus, whatever the endpoint takes care of it. So why should right. wireless be any different? Yeah. So, so the reason for that is, is exactly what, what uh, this is, right? So uh, let's <coughs> say you want to do application prioritization. You're doing FaceTime between the two of you over wireless across campus. And I want to prioritize FaceTime. How do I do that? Right? Not with a firewall. No, but what, what, you need is, what, you, what you need is application classification. What firewalls do is flow classification and then apply actions, right? The firewall action is one set of actions. The more interesting actions are really around application delivery, right? Take video traffic, and when, I'm, when I have FaceTime, um, as opposed to, let's say, you're browsing a web page, right? That doesn't take, require the priority. I have two options. I just trust the WMM bits that are coming from your device and give them the priority. I call it the uh, untrusted model because your gaming device could request the highest priority. In fact, we've seen that. Uh, you know, go to the WMMQ0, you know, I want it to be the same priority as voice, and pretty soon everything is on Q0 if you do that. If the network actually examined the packets and said, no, I, I recognize this, this packet, it belongs to a video stream, and I'm going to allow it to go through at high QoS, but I'm going to disable the other ones that are being requested. That kind of action is what is interesting. And um, that is why application intelligence and things like that need to be built into the wireless network, right? So, Not just the <clears throat> permit deny type actions that a firewall so does. So the message that I'm getting is, is the built-in firewall is not about security, it's about application optimization. It's about both, uh, if you want to. So, so the security access model that, that we see is the classic one that I see is torrents, disabled torrents, uh, which happens, you know, a lot of times students are sharing uh, information over torrents uh, on campus. So if you want to disable torrents, how do you do that? As opposed to not other types of traffic that might happen. You want to enable FaceTime, but disable torrent. Um, yeah, yeah but, but it's too late, right? Uh, by the time it hits the packet here, if you're, if you're doing torrents between the two of you. Imagine traffic now flowing within the campus, not exiting the campus and going out to the, to the data center. Um, but but the point you're making is right. Uh, I don't want to belabor the, the point. The point is security actions are less interesting, frankly. The, the application delivery actions are the more interesting ones. And 
Go ahead. So the uh, couple of things that uh, we talked about in the third layer is disconnecting users and access users. So imagine that you have a guest user that comes into the network who has some kind of a bias. Please, please speak up just a little sure. bit. Sure, to them. That way you can catch your camera as well. Yeah. <coughs> so even though... Uh, <coughs> That's, uh, by the way, that's, uh, I'll introduce Pradeep Iyer, uh, who's the speaker here. He's a founding engineer. He'll speak to you about Aruba Instant uh, a little bit later. So I think traditional firewalls, of course, uh, do permit deny actions. So what we do uniquely, let me take a use case. Let's say that a guest user comes into the network, and he has some virus, antivirus. He has some virus. He's kind of flooding your network. So the best way to uh, stop the user is kind of stop his associations. Because if you stop him connecting into the wireless LAN, then he is not to, he's not going to take up valuable spectrum. Because there's no way, if, you, if he connects into the wireless LAN, by the time that packet goes into the controller and we block it, you've used valuable spectrum in the air. And that is also, we consider, a wireless firewall action. So there is value in doing security actions. Using the over the air security over actions. Over the air security actions. So to, to borrow terminology from Greg Farrow, he refers to the firewall as the crunchy edge. But historically, the crunchy edge has been pointed out to the lawless internet. Essentially, you guys are taking the position that now the lawless internet is inside your organization, so you're building the crunchy edge all the way around the network? Effectively, yeah. I mean, if you look at guests and BYOD and all these things, that crunchy edge is on the inside now, well, rather than facing but, outside. To get back to your original question, is that whether you're wired or wireless, we believe that every single user should be given, should role-based access control should be applied to every single user, whether, regardless of how they get it. And that's, if you look at all of our suite of applications and products, that's what we do. Every single user, whether they're wired or wireless, should have a role assigned and policy enforced based on that. So that's kind of different. There's no difference for us wired or wireless. So role-based role -based access control is not, a, is not a firewall function, right? It's a, um, uh, so, so I guess I'm having a hard time understanding um, if you've got, say, for example, a malicious user, um, what's the difference between that malicious user dropping a couple of packets on the network and then being disassociated versus disassociating them at the AP? Is there really that big of a difference? No, but the idea is that how do you identify the malicious user? Well, if you're feeding all that traffic upstream to a controller anyway. Right? Yeah, so, so the, the question is not where the firewall is running. Right? So they are for us. Access points and controller are just, uh, think of them as doing some functions. So the fact that we do it on the controller access point is not important. The, the, uh, the, what is important is identify what he was saying is that at the edge of the network, you have to become user aware, you have to become application aware, so that you can take actions. Because devices are going to be mixed use devices to be BYOD. The network is going to become mixed use network because your employees and guests will access the network. That's different than wired. Uh, there's the, the, also like a manageability problem here, right? Security, when you have a VLAN-based model, I mean, you can deploy so many VLANs, and you can try to segment people and, and enforce different policies that way based on VLANs and IP networks and traditional firewalls. But once you get to, like, a huge, you know, environment, that becomes a, a big scale and manageability problem. And how many VLANs can you realistically manage? How yeah. many different policies can you realistically manage at, at multiple different end or places within your network? If you have kind of a, I think, a common definition point, and then enforcement point closest to the edge as possible. You can take care of that just distributed throughout your network and, 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 be, and you can kind of solve that problem without having to rely on different subnets and tying the uh, user role to an IP that they're in because then the firewall knows IP and, and ACLs and things like that. But I think their approach is tied to the user, not to what IP and VLAN we end up putting them in because then you know, you're know you more representing the user the role, not what hap you know a network location, in, uh, meaning a VLAN or something like that, which... Yes, yeah, so that's, 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 that's exactly right. So b b basically, uh, that, that is the, the, the whole definition of what the packet processing flow is, is remember all these actions are being applied to the user. There's no indirections in the middle like VLANs where the firewall is saying, which subnet did the traffic come from and what policy should I apply? And by the way, if I added a new subnet, my policy changed. At coordinating all that manually, it wasn't difficult to do because the changes weren't significant on the wired side. On the wireless side, it's just expanding, right? The use cases are just blowing up on a daily basis, new policies that need to be implemented. And I can't manually coordinate that anymore. I need a dynamic model to do this. And this flow needs to be automated. Right, and the way I think about it is, 
an IP address is there to give you connectivity and <coughs> been used historically to provide for a, a basis for other things like security, but at the end of the day, it's just an IP address so you can talk to some other endpoints. You know, why do we care what their IP is to enforce the security? I mean, let's do it from, based on who they are, not necessarily what IP they have. And so, so are we seeing the same security model across your switching line as well? Yeah, so to us, um, to us, this process is independent of wired or wireless. Right? How you connect is actually the secondary part to this. What you want to do with the flow is pretty much what, what determines policy, which is the reason why you can apply this to wired, you can apply this to wireless. So you're talking about a, a layer two, three firewalls built into all your switching products as well? Layer, layer uh, four, <coughs> layer four plus, layer four plus, layer four plus. Um, and and uh, the, the other interesting part I want to you know, spend a second on which um, you know never really happened on the wired side is enabling new services based on the context of the user and the device of that particular connection, right? So one simple example that I give people is if you if you're using an iPhone, you're in the zone of Wi-Fi coverage. Life is good, but the moment you walk out the door or maybe even twist around in your rotating chair, Wi-Fi signal might drop, and suddenly you're on the three G side. Uh, all your applications that you, you had access to the second before that, now you don't have access anymore. Well, in a, in a non-unified access world, what that means is double click on the VPN client or, or swipe to the VPN client, turn it on, let establish the VPN connection when you're on 3G, and get access to your applications. That is very cumbersome from a user experience. It worked okay when VPN was something explicit that you wanted to do. Uh, with laptops where you know you're away from the enterprise and you're connecting, double clicking, and so on. In mobile, that needs to be completely behind the scenes and, and should not be a factor in determining network connectivity, which is why we think the line between VPNs and local access needs to blur. And you have one access method you dial in. VPN is a tunnel that goes over the internet. Wi-Fi, you're on the LAN, and they should coexist. And, and that should be auto-connecting the VPN over 3G, for example, is simply based on the context. I just saw this user drop, and we have a client that does this, by the way, that al allows you to do the auto-connect part. More interesting actions, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask you a, a, a little bit more about your uh, identifying and having the user at the center of this. Um, do you see that as also extending to um, the actual applications that the users are running? So like the way that the MDM solutions are trying to identify particular applications within some of the, the BYOD devices and being able to identify not only the user but what applications that they're using as being central to putting that security chunk, crunchy shell around? Yes, I do. Uh, and um, there's again multiple techniques to get to the application layer. Um, one is we discussed this deep packet inspection flow classification technique. Uh, which can take you to some, some extent, but will not take you all the way. Um, you need to, frankly, have another mechanism by which the application themselves know when you logged on. Uh, and, and the use case for this is basically single sign-on. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll spend a second on this topic because I think it's quite important. If you look at uh, the access control mechanism for enterprises today, they all live inside if you're using the Windows suite of applications and Microsoft certified applications, the permissions live inside Active Directory. Um, the moment you go out of that, there's another set of logons that you get created. Let's say you're doing SAP. There's an SAP database. Let's say you're doing salesforce.com on the cloud, the salesforce.com database. And so at the back end, there is work that people are trying to do to coordinate authentication across the two to enable single sign-on experience. Not gone too far in the industry, mostly because they all compete with each other. Uh, the network here can actually be a intermediary, right? Because with .1x now, the, the, you see, if you look at until 802.1x happened, the network was a freeway. Plug in, get an IP address, and off you go. Now, with authentication, you know who is connecting into the network, and you can share that with applications. You can share that with the Windows suite. You can share that with this SAP suite. You can share that with even the cloud. And so eventually, the way I see this emerging 
is as you get to an authenticated access architecture in the LAN, the login credentials and, and how you bring users onto the network gets shared with applications and then enable a single sign. It's a longer term vision, but we certainly see the, the roots of that actually uh, getting started right now with authenticated access. Am I making sense? Yes, kind of in a way, but uh, I guess what I was getting at more is like with, with many of these uh, applications, the, I, I kind of see there's two different levels. There's, there's one, you're authenticating a user to the network, you're trying to identify who the user is and what applications they're using, and then there's another layer which is more like um, the, the layer that's addressed by DLP type applications where you're actually wanting to know what the data is that the user is, is using and how secure that data is from whether it's corporate data versus end user data type thing that the enterprises want to have some control over that data as well as okay. just simply being able to authenticate the user. Yeah, so um, in that realm, um, we, we will have to get into the device uh, to some extent uh, as allowable by the device. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, if you look at iOS, they have an MDM API that allows you to actually push applications to the device and do some level of application access control. And uh, even, and iOS has a pretty good data security model associated with the, with the app itself. But, but the um, corporate concern increasingly is how do I create a sandbox within the device that allows me to control all corporate data and so that when, I, when a device gets lost or if the employee no longer serves for the company, I can erase that data remotely. Um, it works okay in the context of one application, but in the context of multiple applications, there's no common store that you can, you can do, today at least. And um, I think the industry is emerging in that direction, where eventually um, there will be a sandbox which apps can read and write from. Uh, I don't think the technology exists today at this point. Uh, a good example, I'll tell you, good is, a, is an example of how they do email uh, or, or browsers, but nobody wants to use a separate browser. You want to use the native mail app and the native, native uh, browser, well, right? For example, I, I'm hearing a lot of people are using good in the federal space specifically because they have that ability of saying we're, yeah. we're totally isolating all of that data from any of the end user data on the device. Yeah. Uh, and federal, I think, is appropriately so because of the security risk associated with the data, right? Uh, but the users don't want to use you know, specialized apps. They want to use the apps that they're used to. So uh, the ultimate model needs to be there's, there's a corporate store that the app reads and writes from. Yeah. And, and is it, you can blow off the corporate store whenever so you want. even making it even more finer grained than just identifying the user. You're actually getting down to, we want to identify what this corporate data store is. Correct, correct. And that's, I think that's where the industry is going to head. It's unfortunately not at a stage where we can say that's the answer today. Uh, we can get to doing remote wipes fairly consistently, but a lot of times that will wipe the entire device. So even con controlling that to corporate app remote wipe is probably the best you can do today. Um, so some other use cases I want to mention on the enabling new services, uh, the, the, the things I'm beginning to hear is, uh, you know, devices get lost. You tend to forget them in conference rooms, libraries, et cetera. Um, you can find devices when you're outdoors. Um, Apple certainly helps you with that, and other, other device makers do that too. But what happens indoors? Um, indoor GPS doesn't really work. And, and so can Wi-Fi now step in with location-based service with an API that allows you to locate your device based on the user? So the network knows user device because we provisioned the device, and we'll talk more about how we do that later. But if you forgot, there might be a user API that says, query, where, where is my device right now? And, and you can triangulate it and say, here, you forgot in this library in this particular zone. That, those kinds of services don't exist on networks today. And, and we think, um, we, if, if you start to imagine what the future is going to look like, that's that's interesting set of services that you could create. Um, similar to find my nearest printer, that's the other piece. If you are mobile on campus, you want to print to the closest printer, not to the printer in your office. How do you do that and things like that? The, the piece I want to mention here, and I want to spend a little bit of time. I know we are running late here. Yeah, we have like two, three minutes. Okay. 
So the policy enforcement process, the packet processing process that I walked you through, um, initially we developed it on the mobility controller uh, product line. But as we heard customers ask for similar policy enforcement for smaller deployments where a controller may not exist, we've actually taken this policy enforcement mechanism and, and implemented it in an access point. Uh, we call it the Aruba Instant Access Point and there's a virtual controller function that comes in. When we say virtual controller, we've taken the, the key uh, attributes of a mobility controller, virtualized it inside the software of an access point. So you can take a set of access points and run them as basically a, a, a virtual uh, controller, if you will. What's the number, the quantity limit? Is it just for small office, home office? Is it like five or less? Yeah, I, I, we like to answer that in terms of number of users. Um, so because access points is you can have any number that you might, might want. Uh, up to 512 users is, is OK today, and we'll expand it further. That's in the context of a single instant uh, virtual controller. You can have, as you grow, you can have multiple virtual controllers on a network. Um, and, we, and Pradeep will talk more about that during the instant session. And then, of course, the access switches uh, will have similar functionality as well. So, so uh, in terms of how things get deployed, um, the way we see it in terms of when you deploy Aruba instant style networks versus a controller style network versus a switch. Um, here's an example of, you know, I have an existing wiring closet. Switches are already installed. I have my voice data VLANs on the wired side. I want to add a wireless network. The thing we typically go in there, de depending on the size of the network, plug in access points to the edge of the network, uh, make it really, we have really put a lot of focus on making it trivial to install this, this uh, Aruba Instant uh, solution. Uh, less than three minutes, uh, be able to bring up an entire wireless network, right, and plug in multiple access points into the network, you need to provision one of the access points. The rest of the access point behaves just like a controller. When you plug in the second one, contacts the, the first access point, downloads its image, and sets up a, uh, a virtual controller network. Uh, you want to add, and this is just you know adding wireless as a service. The integration here, as you can imagine, between the wireless and the wired network is the VLAN model still. Because this is still what I have, and what, did I, what my wired network understands is VLANs. So as I add more services on this network, you know, BYOD, guest, and so on, that interface model doesn't change. It's still going to be a VLAN, but the wireless aspect of it, we can, we can simplify with common services and policy enforcement. Uh, we call it AAA services. AAA to us stands for Airwave, Amigo, Pod, and Avenda. <laughs> um, <laughs> then, then you go. Well, I like your story. I give you, I'll give you a shot at the wiring closet. I want to right size it. I want to reduce the number of switches. How can you unify wired and wireless? The thing we can do, obviously, is provide PoE and so on to the access points. But the complexity that, that's around this integration with VLANs at the edge, you can absorb. And push policy enforcement into the wiring closet from the instant uh, solution. When you have an Aruba switch, operating with an Aruba access point. Okay. Behind the switch, obviously, is still VLANs, because the rest of the core doesn't quite understand context. Now you grow this network, and, and you add multiple wiring closets. This is now you're becoming a campus. That's when the mobility controllers come into the picture, where you take the complexity of the VLANs and suck it all in into the mobility controller. And, and now I really don't have to touch do VLANs on my network anymore. You, for wired and wireless, you essentially have the ability to define policies, enforce policies, and be able to affect the policies at the edge. The classification of the packets and so on will happen in the controllers. The actual actions will be taken at the edge on the access points and the switches. So that's um, the, the evolution of how, when to use Aruba Instant, when to use the switches, and when to use the controllers as we grow. And um, the one question that we asked ourselves is um, around scale. The question that came up, which is, um, how large does a virtual controller architecture grow to? And we, I said 512 uh, uh, you know, you know, users. The, the other reason for that is mobility within a virtual controller is limited to layer 2 mobility today. 
And we constantly ask ourselves the question, should we be adding layer three mobility? And, and it's something we will do in the future. But there's a, there's a trade off that, uh, you know, in the industry, not many people are talking about, which I wanted to actually mention. It's a pretty simple thing to think about, which is as you roam between VLANs, what happens? You start out with a home AP, typically what I call the lobby access point, connect into the network, get onto your wireless, you know, wireless VLAN, and off you go. Now you roam. You ro go to another floor, go to your office, a conference room, whatever. You cross the VLAN boundary. And what does the traffic flow look like, assuming the home AP is anchoring your connections? Because you've got your IP address here. Right? Uh, the traffic flow to reach this device from a server is that. It's kind of counterintuitive. People say mobility controllers, you have to trombone traffic. It has to go and come back. But in reality, when you do layer three mobility on the access points, this is the flow. And what ends up happening, the result of it, the first thing that we care about the most is what is the AP doing? AP's job to us is pick up traffic over the air, put it on the wire. Pick up traffic over the wire, put it on the, on the air. Here it's not doing that. Here it is picking up traffic on the wire and putting it back on the wire. So now it's serving as a mobility anchor and for layer three mobility. And as you start to imagine a world where mobility is constant, you're moving around all over the place, this is gonna happen a lot in your network. If you anchor mobility, layer three mobility towards the edge of your network. Imagine troubleshooting this when there's a lot of, lot of uh, mobility events going on. It's a big nightmare. Uh, but more importantly for us, we ask ourselves, okay, fine. We, and, and by the way, we will do this for smaller networks, don't get, get us wrong. But for larger networks, that access point design has to change now. Because um, depending on how much traffic I'm doing a U-turn on in the access point, my CPU horsepower on the access point needs to go up. I might need to provision multiple gigabit Ethernet ports. Uh, because not only am I picking up traffic on the air and putting it on the wire, I'm doing these U-turns. So, so basically your APs that you design for wireless to wired, kind of that function goes away. And this is really what controllers help with. Where, where you, you place a controller in the middle, your flow is basically simple, right? You, you move from one, one, one uh, AP to another, you're not doing any U-turns. The mobility anchor actually is inside the network, deeper inside the network. And the larger your mobility domain, the deeper the controller needs to be in order to avoid this kind of a, a architectural U-turn. So, so it is something that um, maybe the industry has forgotten, I don't know. Uh, it, it is something that we felt we needed to remind ourselves, frankly, about what constitutes good network design and architecture. In this case, we can tell you mobility controllers will reduce both network load and AP loads and help you troubleshoot and manage networks better. So, so that's the boundary that we draw, when to go with Aruba instant-based deployments and when to go with uh, a controller-based deployment. It's really how much layer three mobility that, that you see in your network and how large your network is. Any, any questions? What about when you have multiple mobility controls in different layer three networks? Then mobility controllers will tunnel traffic to each other. Yes, that is a situation where, where you do need uh, basically tunneling between the controllers, but you're not, sending it all the way to the edge and returning the traffic back to the controllers. Chris, we have one minute to wrap up. It, it seems like this, um, you know, obviously, I, you, know, you, make, you make a good point, but it also seems like a function that, you know, to be the one function that determines whether or not you implement a controller, you know, mobility controller or not, or, or to do you know, virtualized control on APs, that seems like a pretty massive redesign you know, for just that one, one reason. Is there any, I don't know, I guess I'm thinking big, big mobility controller, you know, big iron, instead of maybe just using a single AP that's dedicated as you know, a layer three tunneling agent or something like that, is that, is that a possibility? Uh, yeah, so I mean, what, what you end up with if you do that, right, you basically end up with a bank of APs here doing, doing mobility controller, and then you go, you know, you can do that or you can put it in one big ion. Right, yeah, 
Yeah, and that's, that's true. I, I, it all depends on the scale. And how it, much absolutely. It depends on how much traffic and scale and mobility you have in the network. I think that, that is absolutely a true statement. I think there's two reasons. Layer 3 mobility is one. Uh, I call it a mobility anchor. right? Where do you want the mobility anchor VLAN to be? And the deeper in your network, the better off your design will be. Uh, and then you figure out how much traffic you're putting through this thing. You take that and you add the policy enforcement discussion that we just had around what the data path ought to do. I can throw a lot more horsepower, frankly, at packet processing in a controller than I can in an AP. And uh, so, so performance-wise as well, you're going to be able to do a lot better in larger scale networks. There's also uh, the possibility of using uh, our VF client to terminate you know, VPNs on controllers. So for remote users that maybe aren't using wireless, maybe they're coming in over a 3G or you know, some sort of cellular connection, or if they're in a wireless hotspot and needs VPN back into the network so that they can access corporate resources, you know, uh, VPN into a controller makes sense. VPNing into an access point doesn't sure. Yeah. And in fact, that's, uh, that's basically the next point is the same controller bank can be used to reach out to the remote sites. Uh, we, we came up with the notion of a remote AP five years ago. Uh, telecommuters, remote branches, and so on, all you need is small access points that tunnel back. And then, of course, as Carlos said, if, you, if you're a true road warrior, you don't want to carry AP with you everywhere, uh, the VIA client. And the idea behind the VIA client was to not have to double click that VPN. It just happens in the background, uh, built really for mobility. Wouldn't a better way to approach that problem be um, to tie that um, identity management piece more t uh, solidly to the client so we're not relying on protocols that, that have that kind of an impact in the network to be able to say, okay, we've identified this user in one part of the network. When they're moving to a different VLAN over there, there's some inherent part of, of the basic RF protocols is not the OKC and the, the other pro things that we're using today, but is, is developed just to, to basically closer tie the identification of that individual when they move over the network so you don't actually have to, to have all of that authentication come all the way back to a controller. Yeah, the, the um Issue is not so much the authentication in this case as it is IP addressing, unfortunately, the layer three mobility case, the which is your network can take care of the IP as long as you've identified the user, right? N not really, because the mobile device once you once a Wi-Fi comes on and you get an IP address, it just stays with that IP address for the rest of the day as long as you have signal, mm -hmm. right? And, and so you have to, and which means your entry exit VLAN, if you will is the home VLAN that, right, that, right. that you came part in on. Of, part of the reason for uh, OKC and those types of protocols is to have that VLAN mobility and be able to retain the IP address on the client. But yeah, again, o o OKC has... To, to, to saying that it's, it's better to, to have these functions be part of what the client's doing, have the client be able to um, negotiate with the, the rest of the network it's connecting to, to identify itself, to retain its IP address as it moves, to get those roaming functionalities working better, that we don't actually have that in the wireless network today. We don't yeah. have the, the client side of things tied down enough that, that we've actually got, got a client cooperating with the network, more like a cell phone when it moves from tower to tower. So even in the cell phone case, um, there is a way. Uh, the protocol is mobile IP, actually. Mm -hmm. If you have a mobile IP client, you can actually do it with the client, but unfortunately, no clients implement mobile IP. It's only in a lab, and they tried to do it on the cellular side when, when the migration to 3G happened, and uh, couldn't get the client vendors to adopt it, and, and so proxy mobile IP has kind of taken over. The network is ha handling that function. All OKC really gives you is the ability to reuse the PMK right. when you roam at layer two. The layer three doesn't really allow you to, doesn't change layer three at all. And uh, that's really the problem that we end up end up solving uh, with, with this anchoring concept. And if you look at uh, cellular networks, it's pretty much the same. There's a radio tower, and there's a, a, a concept called a GGSN, or a home node, home agent, where you're tunneling in and out. Now, for them, of course, they want to see all your traffic anyway, so they'll tunnel it back to that GGSN, uh, even when it doesn't make sense, in my opinion. But um, uh, the mobility use case is really what drove the development of that of that concept there. Yeah. Just thinking for the future, you know, the development of the really mobile client starts to come in that maybe we have to 
spend some time with our, our standards organisations to develop true mobility for the client, true identification for the clients in the network. So it makes all of those functionalities a lot easier. I, I would say that I would agree in an ideal world, but wire, Wi-Fi endpoints are not as regulated. And and remember, it's unlicensed right. spectrum, and yeah. private corporations are implementing Wi-Fi networks, whereas there's a small subset of mobile network operators that have control and, and can have much more rigor around the client devices that get on their network. Right. Wi-Fi is almost the wild, wild west compared to 3G or, or cellular. Yeah. It's like, I mean, we can't plan for endpoints and, and end up having ones that don't, and you can't rely on it. And I, I just think, you know, I mean, in an ideal world, yes, we'd love to have control, more control over those endpoints, and, and that's why there are some, you know, IEEE amendments, you know, to facilitate some interaction and some smarts in the devices, but, you know, it's one of those things where it's going to have to be, you know, optional, and if, if, if they support it, great. If they don't, then we're going to have to take that on as an infrastructure and solve that problem without them. That's kind of the mode we're in, yeah. unfortunately. We we have the standards, actually. There's 11R, there's 11V, there's 11K. If they just did those three, I'd be very happy, because there's a lot we can do with those three things. Uh, but unfortunately, we've not, I think, Maybe in five years, we'll have a little bit more information uh, from the client to optimize the RF connection. Uh, but the mobility layer is probably the next layer above, which frankly, there's not a lot of action right now. Anyway, that is pretty much it. Uh, I will turn it back to, uh, I guess, Carlos and Cam, who are going to go through the demos of the, of the BYOD uh, scenarios. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kirti. So before we hand it over to 